Uh, my name is Marla Gilliam, and I am the president of Century Lending. Welcome, and we are very excited about our guest today. Uh, we have our special guest is a local um, person who is a Louisvillian who went to St. Agnes Elementary School. Also is a St. X graduate, went to Bellarmine College, and got his PhD at University of Kentucky, go Big Blue. <laughs> and he is a chief economist for the National Builders Association. And we're very, very excited to have him here. So please welcome Dr. David Crow. Well, thank you so much for that gracious introduction. Uh, and yes, I'm a, I'm a native of Louisville. I, I'm now a resident of Washington, D.C. It happens to the best of us. Um, so I, I work for the National Association of Home Builders, uh, developing their economic information and then using that to speak for the uh, home builders in Washington. Uh, but I'd like today to give you some sense of where we think, think things are going. Uh, and my address is built around this notion that the upcoming year is going to be really good, uh, I think, uh, and that's what my forecast is. And in fact, it's so good that when I spoke to the home builders in Las Vegas a couple of weeks ago at the uh, International Builder Show, they were a little doubtful about whether or not this forecast could come true. They said, maybe you're a little too aggressive. So I've built the presentation around the notion that there are a lot of reasons why I believe it to be true. And I'm going to try to present that proof to you, that information, that documentation of current uh, and expected uh, uh, future uh, expectations, future happenings, future data that will convince you, I hope, um, that in fact we are in for a reasonably good uh, 2014 and actually on into 2015. And so the reasons behind that are really fivefold. First of all, we've seen the consumer come back again. They've lost a lot of that doubt, a lot of that fog that was in their head, a lot of that concern about uh, whether their house values are going to increase, whether their job was going to stick around, uh, whether the economy was going to move forward, or we're going to slip back into another reception, recession. So all of that um, black cloud is beginning to di disperse, and, and people are getting a little more confident in the future. I'll give you a couple of uh, uh, particular explanations behind that. That delay, that, that pause that everyone has uh, uh, caused, uh, it means we got a pent, pent up demand. We got a lot of backlog, a lot of people who would have otherwise moved, or otherwise purchased a home that haven't. So that pent up demand is out there waiting uh, for these uh, pieces of good news in this uh, building and confidence. Um, we have a growing need for new construction. Out of that pent up demand, it's going to be important that the new home market rise to the occasion and actually answer that demand. Again, there's some reasons why it's going to be even more incumbent the new side than perhaps the existing resale market uh, to come forward and answer the demand. The distressed sales, okay, so they're still out there. There's no question they're, they haven't disappeared, but they're much less a problem and therefore much less of a depressant upon house prices and upon the market in general. And I'll show you uh, at least one evidence of that. And then it's what I get from the feedback from the builders. So I speak to them and I ask them questions through surveys and I'm getting that same kind of information. So those are my five points. Let me, let me go through those uh, sequentially. So the first one is the consumer's back. And I have to start with this sort of uh, mandatory economic slide. Uh, you know, this is sort of, this keeps my license as an economist. Um, <laughs> Uh, you know, they, they, they invented weathermen to make <laughs> economists look good. Uh, and so one of the other things that economists do is to say, what's going to happen in the overall economy? How can I, in one single picture, give you a sense for where the economy is going? And so this is what we call gross domestic product. It's the overall output of the country. Uh, the bars going up mean we're growing, we're positive, and the bars going down mean we're negative, we're losing economic strength. That gray area is the Great Recession when, in fact, we had a loss in output, a loss in economic vitality. And then since then, over to the red, which is the uh, divides history from forecast. So between the end of the recession and now, we've had this erratic recovery. It hasn't really been strong. Uh, it, a couple of quarters have been strong, but not consistently. 
Uh, and that's part of the reason behind this hesitancy. No one can see any kind of consistent pattern out there to feel comfortable that we really are started off on a path that's sustainable. I think that is changing. I think we've gotten rid of, the, of many of these clouds. And so my forecast, therefore, is for a nice solid 3% growth this year and 3.7% growth next year. Very solid growth. Now, we'll mention two things. Number one, the very beginning of the year hasn't been quite what we expected it to be, we economists in general. And so I will already offer that maybe the 3% growth for this year will actually turn out to be 2.9 or maybe even 2.8. I'm not willing to go any lower than that, uh, but I do realize that the little bit of slower start um, could put a little temper on the year. But I still think it will be strong, certainly stronger than it has been in the past, and more consistent. That's as important as the, as the level of it, is that it's more consistent, more repeatable, more building a confidence behind uh, people's attitudes and therefore them doing something about it. Employment is a big part of that. And so uh, the blue line is total employment in the country. So you can see it rose uh, to we had about almost 149 million people working in the US. And then of course it collapsed during the recession. And now it's risen back up again to with, within 99% of the peak. So we have almost completely re-employed all of those people that lost their job during the recession. So that's good news and that's an important uh, a hallmark in being able to get back to a recovery. It's not quite all the way there because that, that uh, horizontal, I mean that uh, uh, inclining line, that uh, smooth line is the uh, projection of where we should be, where we sort of the steady growth path because we're growing in population so we have to employ more people. So we still have a gap of about five million jobs in the country um, to finally make up for not only the people that lost their jobs, but now the people that aged into the workforce. So we have to employ them as well. So we still have a ways to go to get all the way back. The fact that we're nearly back to peak is a good sign. And in fact, in Louisville, uh, we're already up to that peak. We all, we're 1% we're over the full employment that we had in uh, late 2007. So in Louisville, we've got a little bit ahead of that re-employing of the unemployed. But the same thing's true there, too. We need to go even faster and farther because we have to employ those people that aged into the um, uh, workforce since then. Unemployment rate has been falling. It's been falling nationally. That's the blue line. And I've progr I forecast that that will continue. And it's been falling in the state of Kentucky and in Louisville, um, where it's still a little above the national level, but not much. I caution, however, that using the unemployment rate um, is still a little fragile. And the reason for that is we've had what we call a reduction in participation. And so if you're not employed and you're not looking for a job, you're not in any of my numbers. You're outside of all of this. You're not unemployed. You're simply out of the workforce. And the number of people and the percentage of people that are out of the workforce have been increasing. And job participation has been decreasing. So one of the reasons you're seeing a fall in unemployment <coughs> is not because they got a job. It's because they left the system, if you will. And so it's much more uh, uh, wise, uh, much smarter move to observe where employment is going pay less attention to the unemployment rate. Not ignore it, but pay less attention to it until we get back to a more reasonable participation rate. Several companies uh, ask consumers uh, every month about their attitudes towards the current and future uh, economic progress. They're called sentiment indexes or confidence indexes. And so they've come way back up from where they were at the depths of the recession. Um, they're now not quite to where they were at the peak, but they're still much higher than they were at any time during the recession. So it's another indication that people are feeling better about where they are and where things are going. Probably a better way to measure that is what are they actually doing? It's one thing to ask people how they feel, because frankly they can feel good one day and bad the next day for completely erratic reasons. But what, what more importantly is what are they really doing with their money? If you think about it for a minute, um, if you're worried about your future, you're probably not going to go out and spend money on something that you don't absolutely need right now. So you don't need necessarily to replace a, 
a couch or a chair or a refrigerator. You don't necessarily need to replace your automobile. You can sometimes make bailing wire and chewing gum and put it back together again for another year. Uh, so how people spend their money on durables has an indication of how they feel. So durables, home furnishing expenditures, are above where they were at the peak of the, of the last boom. So that's a pretty strong indication that people are feeling good about their job and their job prospects in the future if they're actually going out and spending money on things that could otherwise be postponed. Same with motor vehicles. This is dollar amount here. Not quite up to the peak, but near the peak. And, do, and, and vehicle count and actual unit account has a similar level almost near the peak. So it's just a further indication of this confidence building. The only one I don't have on here of durables is housing. And so the, the logical conclusion from this kind of a, a information is that that's sort of the next thing to come, is that people will feel comfortable enough to begin to spend money on a, on a durable like a house. And then finally, in terms of confidence, <coughs> There's this thing called a uh, household balance sheet. You know, where, is, where are their financial situation? Uh, and so one way to show that is what, how much money are they saving uh, as relative to their income? And how much debt do they have relative to their income? So they're saving about 4% of their income. That's sort of near where it was back when things were a little more reasonable back in the early 2000s. It shot up during the recession. Why did it shoot up? Why did people save more of their income during the recession? Well, they lost money in the stock market. They lost money in the house values. They got worried about their, their job, and so they saved money for a rainy day and to replenish some of the net worth that they lost. Um, good from the standpoint of personal planning, bad from the standpoint of if you're saving, you're not spending. If you don't spend on stuff, then whoever makes that stuff isn't employed, and so they get worried about their job, and so they start saving, and they don't spend money on stuff. So you see how you get that downward spiral. That, in fact, is how you get a recession. More and more people getting more and more conservative, losing their jobs, having less to spend. So that part of their uh, income is more back to a more reasonable, normal level. Same with their debt. They, they were borrowing, borrowing, borrowing. Uh, the music was never going to end, so they just kept borrowing until they had uh, a debt to income of 130 percent. They had they had debts outstanding. This is average household, so it includes renters and owners. They had a total debt outstanding of 130 percent of annual income, way over what it would normally was back in the early 2000s. So they started paying down their debt, or in some cases defaulting on their debt. But it, nevertheless, they got rid of it, so they didn't have that as an overhang. It meant again they weren't spending all or weren't moving all of their money into debt payment. They now can move their money into consumption, and so we get back to this more normal market of where people can spend instead of save or pay for past spending, uh, and we can have a more robust economy. Um, that shows also in housing. In the state of Kentucky, we've seen, after a pause in 2011, we've seen some decent increases in production in Kentucky. And similarly, we've seen some decent, decent increases in the Louisville metropolitan area. So there's, there's other, even though some of this has come slow, and you have to kind of look backwards to remember that there's <coughs> been some progress, there actually has been some decent progress so far. So part of this uh, reason for believing that 14 will be better than 13 is that we're building upon a reasonably solid base. So what about the pent-up demand? We know that there is demand out there. We see that it seems to have all the signals of coming forward pretty soon. So there's a couple of ways to explain that. One is household formations. How many additional households do we have now as opposed to last year? So this graph is quarterly numbers. Uh, and so they kind of bounce around, so it's easier to look at an average. So during the early 2000s, we were adding 1.4 million households every year. Now think about it for a minute. If you're a home builder, why do you build a house? You build a house because there's more people that want to live independently, that are households. You may not sell your house to that new household, to a new married couple that just moved out of their parents' home and formed a new household. But that expansion in the number of people living in their own home means somewhere along the line we have to build another house to take care of that. That's why you build houses. It's the fundamental underlying reason why there's more houses being built. 
So we were building a lot of houses back then, uh, enough to satisfy this demand as well as uh, replacement of destroyed homes and some other reasons. Virtually all of them were going in to be homeowners, as I like to say. If you could fog a mirror, you could buy a house. You could get a mortgage and you could buy a house, and most of them did. All of this increase, only 12% of it was renters. Most of it was owners. Then came along the recession. Nobody, very few people could get a job, particularly the young people that were just moving forward that are the primary focus behind household formations. And so that formation rate collapsed. It went down to half a million. This is the reason we stopped building houses. Not really because we built too many. It was a small part of it and isolated in a few markets. The real reason was if you suddenly have an enormous drop in demand, what you learn in elementary economics, if you have a drop in demand for something, you stop producing that something until the demand catches up with what you are producing. So we had a lot of existing homes out there. In fact, we had an excess of them because many people were folding themselves into one household because they lost their home or just couldn't afford their home. So we already had plenty of houses. We don't need any more. So we stopped building houses. That's the real reason behind the collapse in the housing industry, behind the collapse in the construction industry. We're starting back up again. We're, we're up at an average of 600,000. Um, there have been a couple of quarters where that's been better than that. But it is a sign that this <coughs> pent-up demand is starting to release itself. Part of, of that slowdown in household formations is because kids stayed home. They didn't move out of their parents' home. They didn't have enough money or they didn't feel confident enough. Young adults, usually about 11 or 12 percent of them stayed at home with mom. Now this, when I'm talking about young adults, I'm talking about 25 to 34. <coughs> So well, this is, they're out of school, there's no real reason why they can't launch, or who knows. But anyway, there's some kind of con consistent level of, of maybe, you know, back in 1990 and 2000. So this is a long-term, fairly stable average of about 11 or 12 percent of that age group, for whatever reason, is still living with mom and dad. But that shot up to almost 20 percent during the recession. Well, they, they, you know, they couldn't, they couldn't launch. They couldn't get other, other enough economic uh, uh, independence to, to move forward. So if they had, if they had maintained this uh, minimum of 10 or 12, 11 or 12 percent, we would have had 3 million more people living independently. Again, this pent-up demand. Now, believe me, <coughs> living in mom's basement, not a sustainable lifestyle for either the mom, dad, or child. So they're going to move forward eventually, and they'll be a source for this pent-up demand. Uh, general population growth, of course, also helps. Uh, you get general population growth, of course, through immigration as well as through uh, what we call domestic births, people uh, just regenerating themselves. And if you get greater population growth, the blue is U.S. and the red is Louisville, just to give you an example, if you get greater population growth than the U.S., that means you have migration. You know, by definition, if you're growing faster than the rest of the country, you have to be gaining where someone else is losing. And so that means you're having uh, people move into your uh, local economy. That's good from the standpoint of home building, good from the standpoint of selling houses, good from the standpoint of making mortgages, because it means greater demand. In the, in the market of Louisville, we've had a little bit of a tail off in that. So we actually aren't a net gainer of population anymore. Uh, what about uh, this idea that the new home construction is going to have to be answer the, the demand at even greater rate than the existing? So I have a couple of ways to explain that. First, here is the trends in new home sales and existing home sales. Existing is in red and red off of this side of the graph, and new is in blue and red off of the other side. Now, it's always been true that there's a significantly more existing home sales, a lot more churn in the existing market than in a new market, but they move concurrently. So we have an increase in both across, this goes all the way back to 1990, so they're pretty much in concert with each other, uh, waving up and down, situations are good, more sales in both, situations turn a little adverse, fewer sales in both. That relationship disappeared during the recession. And part of the reason is this same explanation. If you have too much of something, then you've got to cut back on that until you get back into equilibrium. It's hard to cut back on existing homes. You can burn them down, tear them down, 
a little bit of that going on in places like Detroit, but for the most part, you simply reduce the price until that turns over and stop building new. So that's why we had a much more severe drop in new than existing. So in fact, probably an easier way to explain that is over a very long period, 1990 all the way up through mid-2000s, new home sales were 16% of total home sales. And a pretty, you know, amazing, given the, uh, all the other ups and downs you've seen in history, this is an amazing steady relationship. But that then collapsed, same, same dynamic, same reasoning, where now new home sales are only a little less than 9% of overall sales instead of their normal 16. Another way of saying the same thing, You've got a lot of distance to make up in the new home market to come back up to what seems like some kind of natural relationship between the two. And existing home sales have fallen as well. So we're not only are new smaller relative to existing, but the whole pie has shrunk. And the way to show that is that the turnover rate in existing was about 6% back in the early part of 2000s probably a reasonably normal market. It rose to seven during the boom, so there was a little more churn, a little more turnover during that period. But now it's all the way down to 4%. So existing home market is turning over at a much slower pace. A lot to do with the fact that existing homeowners uh, have a 3.5% mortgage, don't want to give it up, uh, don't have a lot of equity or not enough equity anyway to turn over and move to a new home or are still maybe a little worried about their own economic situation. So, so we're not getting a lot of those existing homes into the marketplace. If we had kept this turnover rate of 6%, we would have sold 4 million additional existing homes over the past four years. That's a lot of uh, home sales that didn't take place. But in that same period, those owners have changed just like they would have normally changed. They've gotten, they've had children, they've moved jobs, they've done all the things that normally induce somebody to move to a different house. So that, again, is another piece of pent up demand, both for the existing side as well as the new side. I'm not gonna try to explain that one. It's better, better to do it this way. What about house prices? A lot of questions about house prices. Are they too high, are they too low, did they increase too much? This is the way I like to explain it. House prices relative to incomes. So in the US, for a very long period of time, there was a pretty stable relationship of people buying homes at roughly 3.2 times their income. Nice rule of thumb. People bought a home a little over three times their annual income. Moved around a little depending upon interest rates and other things, but fairly stable. <coughs> then, during the boom, that shot up to 4.7. So if you could fog a mirror, you could get a mortgage. If you get a mortgage you bought a house and so everybody did and drove prices up but you can't sustain that. that 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 didn't work so they crashed again the good news is they crashed back down to somewhere near what they were over the long-term basis they're a little higher than they were in the long-term basis but there is an explanation for that I'll get to that in a minute so at worst the home prices in the US were 50 percent above where they should have been relative to income for, for Louisville, they were 24% above, and for Kentucky, they were 29% above. There, there's uh, lots of reasons why you have different long-term relationships in different markets. So that's why I use this ratio, relationship, this ratio here, to kind of compare uh, instead of actual house prices, because obviously they're all over the place depending upon where you are. Um, so in all three cases, they are more close to the long-term normal than they were at the peak. And the reason they're a little above that is what I'm observing here, what I'm measuring here are existing home prices. And we are selling a little at the upper end of the market, not the complete upper end, but because there's fewer first-time home buyers in the marketplace right now, the median price, the average price, the observed price of sales tends to be a little higher than you would expect it to be because we've shifted the, the set of homes being sold to the higher end of the price range. So part of this phenomena of these ratios moving up a little bit higher than norm has more to do with a, the current situation than it does with house prices are out of line. So the, the main point of this is simply we've readjusted to these extremes and we're much more in line with what's reasonable given the long term uh, affordability. And in fact, affordability is a measure NASB also uh, conducts. 
And this measures, this line, the US one I'll use as an example to begin with, is basically what does a typical fam what can a typical family afford? So I'm I'm exemplifying a typical family by saying median income. So the median income of a family of four, what can they afford? Well, they can afford, in the case of the US, they can afford about uh, two-thirds of all the homes recently sold. So this is real sales numbers, new and existing, all uh, everything. Um, that line says that in the U.S., a typical family can afford about two-thirds of all the homes sold. In the in Louisville, it's a very affordable market. A typical family in Louisville can afford 84% of all the homes sold. So it's a quick measure, and and this measure actually is available on the. NEHB website for about 220 places so you can find your particular location and what this affordability index looks like. Now what about interest rates? So a lot of worry about interest rates rising, it's going to cut off the market, everything's going to hell in a handbasket. No, I don't think so. Uh, certainly there was some cause for concern uh, in the fall of last year, late summer and fall as uh, interest rates did spike a little bit and it caused everybody concern. There was kind of this immediate knee-jerk reaction, but I think it was just that. I think it was sort of nervousness rather than a real cause for concern. And here's my explanation. First of all, it's a little complicated, so let me, let me explain this for a minute. Interest rates are in that blue line, but I have reversed the scale. So if you'll notice, the interest rates go up as you go down the graph. Okay, so that's a little bit upside down from what you usually see, and it usually causes a little bit of, of uh, hiccup. But here's the reason why. What, what do you think of when you think of interest rates rising? You think of, okay, that tends to temper sales. You get sales going down when rates go up, and vice versa. When rates go down, you get sales going up. So they're in reverse. They move opposite each other. So what if I turned one of them around and made it opposite? then they should move together, at least in terms of one's up, one's down. And sure enough, that's what happens. So you get this, this relationship that says when one goes up, the other goes down by reversing the scale. So that common sense relationship is proven out by this fairly systematic agreement in the two curves until you get out here. And then they, then they diverse, so they do exactly the opposite of what you'd expect. Interest rates went down, and sales went down. Uh, and of course the reason for that was sales went down for a completely different reason. It wasn't interest rate driven. To a certain extent that's still true. And the reason I argue that is it's not the price of credit, it's the availability of credit. Um, still tight credit, still tough. So government controls almost the entire mortgage market. Uh, a lot of ex reasons and explanations, but basically we're still in that condition. So the level of interest rates is a little less important now than it used to be. And it's very low. By historic standards, we're still talking about by the end of this year, my forecast is only 5% higher than it is, partly due to the Fed pulling back, mostly due to the economy growing. As the economy grows, there's other demands upon the credit market and rates are going to rise anyway. But look at the amount of time and the number of sales we've had when interest rates have been below 5%. It's still the majority of history. So we could still sell a lot of houses, new and existing, if we have interest rates at 5 or even higher, which they will eventually go. Distress sales, not the problem they used to be. This is another graph that maybe is a, makes more out of a point than really can be made. But it's simply the top of this line, the top of each one of these, uh, and these are states across the bottom, it represents the serious delinquency rate at the worst in 2009. The top of the blue bar for the same state it indicates the current seriously delinquent rate. So simply stated, in 2009, 20% of all mortgages in Florida were seriously delinquent. That's down to about 12% uh, right now. They've done a lot of work. That really awful state has done a lot of work in getting that down. And that's basically been true of most states. Nevada, a significant, you know, cut more than in half. California, I mean, Arizona, even more than that. Significant uh, work at, at depleting that serious delinquent uh, process. On the other end of the spectrum, some states really didn't have that much problem anyway. They were elevated over normal. They were much, much lower than most states. And they also have reduced it, but they didn't have to work as hard because it didn't have as high a rate. So 
we, we are more, a little more uh, uh, the same across the country in terms of the top of the blue bars are much more close to even than the top of the red bars were. That's the point simply that, that the work, the work, where the work needed to be done, it was done the hardest. Where the work didn't need to be done, it wasn't done, earned, it was done nearly as aggressively. A couple of exceptions to that. If you'll notice, New Jersey and New York, they actually are worse now than they were in 2009. It has to do with the process for resolving mortgages in those states, much more complicated. It's called a judicial process. And so they actually have backlogged a lot of that problem and then still not resolved at all. So the, my story isn't absolutely uh, the same across all states, but for most, that problem is reduced significantly from where it used to be. And then finally, the builders have been sh telling me that they're seeing the stresses that you would expect to see when you're talking about an expanding market. So I asked them for several years now, in January, what were your biggest concerns last year? In, in, so in January of 12, I asked what were your biggest concerns in 11, same way each year. And then I also asked them in January of this year, what do you expect your biggest concerns to be in 2014? So take an example. In 2011, only 13% of the builders told me they were worried about the availability of labor. Well, you know, not many people were working at all, so getting new people really wasn't a big concern. But now that we've gotten demand, now that we've gotten people asking for homes, now that we're expecting to build more and we've got to build up an inventory, two-thirds of the builders are saying they're worried about labor. Same with the availability of lots, that development process that takes place over several years to get a raw land available to actually build a house on it ceased to exist because builders couldn't find uh, financing to be able to do it and frankly they still weren't clear that they needed to do it so that concern went from a fifth of them to over half of them and then building materials have shot up in price and these are all clearly uh, the kinds of signs you would expect to see in expansion you had all of these subsectors of our industries uh, supply uh, lines uh, to home building collapse and they have the same stresses as every other industry that tries to rebuild itself. It's got to garner new labor, new employment, new facilities, build new uh, uh, factories uh, and get the necessary uh, resources together to supply the industry. So uh, that will be a headwind for the home building industry as we go forward and in some ways a reason why while I have an aggressive uh, forecast it's no more aggressive than it is because we can't go any faster than the supply chain can supply us so that leads me to our forecast um, each of the three sectors remodeling multifamily single-family has an index again it's one of those things the home builders uh, I feed them questions about their sector in this case remodeling they answer those questions it allows me to give a sense for how they feel and I turn that into a sentiment index, just like you saw about the consumers, in this case the remodelers. And once again, over 50 means more of them are optimistic than not. So 50 is a big, big deal. It's a big trigger. It's a big tipping point. So this index for remodeling has been over 50 for five of the last quarters. And so I have a modest increase in remodeling. Part of the reason behind it's just modest is because it tends to have already gained most of what it lost. It's not trying to make up for lost ground. It's pretty much just moving forward at the pace you'd expect it to rather than um, uh, trying to make up for a lot of loss as, as would be the case in the new construction side. On the multifamily sector side, that index, which is the blue line, has exceeded 50 for seven straight quarters. So it's, it was the earliest uh, winner in this uh, race, if you will. This was the sector of the new construction that started out the best uh, and the earliest. Uh, and the reason for that, of course, was that demographic information I gave you, was that a lot of the households that did farm all became renters. And so there's a much stronger demand for rental apartments than there had been in the past. And so we were building about 340,000 units back uh, during the 90s even and back into and into the 2000s collapsed like everything else but its recovery was stu sooner than that you'll see in the single family side this uptick took a lot longer to take place uh, and so we're now back up to where we were if you call that normal if you call the three 
40 normal, we've reached that level, probably need to keep going uh, because we will continue to have this larger and more robust demand for rental property than for home ownership, at least for a while. Uh, and so I have you know, sort of a new level at maybe 365. So the acceleration will decline a little bit. We won't go quite as fast, but we're still going to continue to go forward so we kind of reach a new plateau. And then finally, the single family side. Same deal, there's, a, there's an index of single family builders. This is a monthly index now. And so that's been over 50 since the mid part of 2013. Now I have to say, unfortunately, if you pay attention to the media, it did collapse in January. So it had been nice, solid, continued gains, always above 50, always suggesting that we reach that tipping point, and then it collapsed in January. But if you recall, January was an awful month. It was a terrible weather month. And so a lot of houses didn't get started. You, if you couldn't get to the site, if you couldn't get your employees to the site, if you couldn't get construction material to the site, you kind of lost your wind. And so I think it's mostly due to that. And in fact, new home sales were just reported, and they were up in January. So con first to this indication, we still had a better month in January for selling homes, even if we didn't have such a good month for starting homes. So I take that in with a grain of salt, and I think there's still positive news in this index. So I think that means we're going to have continued increase in new home sales. That's this line and some increase in existing home sales. But I go back to my argument that says the gain is going to have to be more made up in the new side because of the reluctance of a lot of existing homeowners to let their house loose. And so some increase in both of them, but most of it coming from new. And if you're going to sell more, that means you have to build more. So the starts forecast is for 822,000 starts in 2014. That's 200,000 more in 2013. That's where I get this hesitancy from builders that say, well, I don't know, that's a pretty strong uh, increase. And that's why I've tried to present the information that says, no, 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 I think I've got enough validating and uh, evidence to prove that to not to be true. Uh, we are only halfway there. So if you take the 2000 to 2003 as a normal period of time, it's the last time we had a normal housing market, we produce 1.3 million single-family homes every year during that period. So if that's our norm, we're only halfway there. So we've got a long way to go. So moving us up to about 70% of the way, which would be what this would get us, uh, doesn't seem to be unreasonable. And then even further next year so that we get almost back to normal. Um, Louisville is a little behind that norm. Uh, and so they, we were right now at 37% of normal. Uh, for the local single family, and by the end of next year, we'll be up to about 69% of normal. Still, again, a, a nice solid increase for this year, but not quite as fast as the rest of the country. Some of that slowdown in population growth will have an effect and will have an outcome. Maybe a better way to look at that is, as I said, the U.S. right now is about halfway back to normal. That's where Kentucky and Louisville will be at the end of the year. And similarly, the U.S. should be about 71% of normal by the end of the year. And that's about where Louisville and Kentucky will be at the end of next year. So still growing just a year behind the rest of the, of the pack. Uh, another way to look at that and by state is the same kind of thing. Where will that state be relative to its own normal by the end of 15? So the dark green states are already there or near there. And what's unique about them? What's, what's, what's the same about all of them? They're energy states or agricultural states. Good, solid, underpinning economics. So this is no longer a housing story. This is a first and primarily uh, economic story. If your job is secure, your income is coming in well, you're going to buy a house. And so home sales and home construction are solid in those states. On the other hand, if you're still a little worried or you have a much, much deeper hole to climb out of, you have a lot further to come to get back to normal, then it's going to be a little longer to take place. So unfortunately, it's mostly the Rust Belt, where they have basically a new underpinning uh, re-evaluation of where their economy is. They've got to build uh, some a base that's not dependent solely upon manufacturing 
to be able to come back. So again, it's all about economics. Housing will ride with that once they solve that underlying problem. That's my story, sticking to it. A uh, couple of resources you're welcome to use anytime you want to, particularly this Ion Housing. It's a blog. Um, a couple times a week, myself or one of my economists uh, pontificates on what we think the latest uh, economic news means and how to interpret it. So uh, written in a way in which um, a non-economist can understand it. So thank you very much for your attention. Questions? Uh, David, at, at what point will we have to seriously consider a, a significant rise in interest rates in short and long term? Are there some triggers, are there indicators you're looking for to say the ride's over? Yeah, I think the, you know, um, interest rates, long-term interest rates are based, you know, upon a couple of things, what everyone else is doing, how much borrowing is taking place, so how much comp competition you have to uh, compete with to get that capital, and where are, is long-term inflation going? So, you know, the longer you look out, the more people need a greater return because they have to protect themselves against higher inflation. Right now, inflation is not a worry at all. The Fed is behaving that way. It's one of the reasons they've had aggressive monetary policy, because they felt like they don't have to worry about inflation. That's not the, the, the potential of too aggressive monetary policy is you, you induce inflation. We're way under capacity. You know, even not when the housing industry is only halfway back. Uh, many other industries, while they may be further than halfway, they still have ways to go to get back. So as long as you have unused capacity, you generally don't worry about inflation. So at least for another couple of years, not worried about inflation, and therefore unlikely that that part of long-term rates will be affected. We certainly will see them rise because of new demand. So new demand because the economy is expanding and there's others reasons to borrow besides just housing will push rates up. Whatever they do about resolving our housing finance system could push them up too. If they return us completely to a private market and so there's no government backing to a secondary market, rates will rise faster. Even if they revert us to uh, a private market, a privately funded market, but some federal backstop, we could, we could see some rates rise a little. But the Congress doesn't seem to be in any particular mood to do that this year. So that also is at least postponable. So whatever it is, it's a long enough spectrum that I can't tell you. That is to say, it's at least a couple years off before I think you have to seriously worry about mortgage rates that would start really inhibiting sales. So the party's on for a while. <laughs> Thank you. Anybody else? Lulled you to sleep. Well, thank you very much for your attention. I appreciate it. Thank you, David. Anybody else? Anything? Thank you all so much for coming. And David, thank you so much. We've enjoyed this. And some good positive attitude and um, a good positive outlook to get more. Oh, one more question. Are the charts that you showed, are those available on, on your website? Or? They aren't, but I'll be glad to figure out a way to make them available to you all. Uh, I'm perfectly happy to share them. As you saw, I skipped through a few just because I didn't want to bog you down in some of the detail. But uh, yeah, happy to share them. Well, and some of the, the states that were interested, I mean, that as well, mm -hmm. we were videotaping, so you'll we'll have it on videotape as well. Yeah. So. Yeah, I'll watch it over and over. And over and over and go, this is green, and this is yellow. <laughs> so very good information. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you all very much.